Yes, it's What a Boast, a celebration of Reeves and Mortimer. Please welcome your hosts for this podcast, MJ Price and Paula Wiseman. Hello and welcome to Quad a Boast, a podcast dedicated to the work and genius of Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer. My name is Matt Price, founder of the Reeves and Mortimer Depository of Curious Stuff Facebook group and... And I am Paula Wiseman, the creator and founder of the Divine Comedians podcast. Today we will be talking to a man who first became known for messing about making jokes and having a daft laugh on Vic and Bob's Big Night Out. His celebrity impersonations were peerless. Rod Stewart, Tom Cruise, Daniel Craig and Thor, God of Thunder, to name but a few. In this episode, we intend to find out the truth about the man behind the mask. Please enter the Novelty Island paddock, born Earl Norman. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm probably one of Britain's leading impressionists. I Um, think so. I think so. Yeah, thank you. I didn't recognise you. Tom Cruise was peerless. (laughs) In fact, one of the episodes, I was Chris Evans. Yeah. And um, the makeup department, I'm sure they won't mind me saying this, scouted around for a... I mean, I'm ginger. Well, I was. Um, and they scouted around for a really nice Chris Evans wig. So we put it on and, they, you know, the, how they do, it's glued down and everything. And Vic and Bob came in and Vic said, oh, I don't like that. Turn it in, Turn it backwards. So they ripped it off, turned it backwards, and he went, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so that's on, the, on the episode, I had I had a really expensive wig that the <laughs> makeup people had spent weeks getting backwards, looking absolutely stupid, which was yeah. great. It was perfect. And, of course, Vic was right, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But apparently they do that either. a lot with wigs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Old Judge Nutmeg's wig was, I think it was yeah. the Lister wig just inside yeah. out, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So and Bob's wig. Set, yeah, Bob's many wigs. Bob's many wigs. Just to set the scene, when we first came up with the idea for this podcast back in the beginning of 2023, one of the first people I contacted was Vaughn, who said, yeah, great, I'll be up for it, fantastic. Really excited. Within a few days of receiving that message, I think Vaughn posted online that he'd had a heart attack. Yes. I just want to check, Vaughn, were the two things connected? Well, I, I actually paid £12,000 to the Nuffield Hospital just to hide in there to avoid actually doing the podcast. <laughs> so we had, you know, some makeup people had favours, so they made me look ill. Um, I read up on, I f- actually, no, seriously, I, I did, and it wasn't connected. No. And unfortunately, whilst uh, recovering from the heart attack, I, yeah, uh, developed septicemia and sepsis Uh, so i was in hospital for about seven weeks Mm. including my birthday yeah oh hospital birthdays are never fun are they well do you know what john and my son mainly john but my son came to and brought me lobster salad and a bottle of champagne (laughs) i sat in the halfway drinking champagne and sucking on uh lobster legs but yeah it was lovely it was a lovely thing for john to do he's such a lovely fella that's your john o'sullivan your comedy yeah, yeah yeah he looks yeah. after me as well since i've been pooly and yeah. um he looks after other people as well friends and he's he's done an amazing job with a friend of mine absolutely amazing yeah he, you know he just does it i i i, I can't talk about it really but um because i'll get upset but he's just been amazing absolutely yeah. amazing for me no. and for this other person yeah well i'm open you but, on, uh, on the yeah now. so I, i'm i'm recovered basically Good. i'm i'm i have apparently sepsis can cause like long covid symptoms and um i don't know if you're aware but i was diagnosed with terminal cancer in 2008 mm. and then spent the next five years getting chemo radiotherapy operations i look like uh rambo with all the scars on my body you know yeah. And um, so I managed to sort of stabilize, get that stabilized. And then that was then I've still got tumors, but the dead as doornails, as the oncologist technically said. <laughs> um, but the other thing was um, it ruined my immune system, all the treatment I was having wow. an AIDS, 
AIDS uh, treatment called, in, it was developed for AIDS, called interferon alpha. And I can't remember if it boosts your immune system or destroys, I think it boosts your immune system so your body recognises that this tumour's there. Because right. obviously, the, the I know it's a bit down this, but the problem with cancer is your body doesn't recognise it as, a, as an evil force, does it? Mm. So anyway, I developed chronic pain syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, wow. psoriatic arthritis anyway. This was before Vic and Bob. Um, but this septicemia has just sort of doubled it up. So I've been pretty uh, inactive, shall we say. Yeah. But still laughing. Oh, you're looking Tired great. Of... You're looking great, Vaughn. You're looking really Tired great. but happy. This took seven <laughs> hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good to see you back on your feet. Seven hours well down. spent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you that's very kind of you uh yeah so yeah it's it's been a rough ride but thank you matt and i always i'm i'm always um glad to talk about vic and bob because the, you know before anything else they're my heroes um i was a massive i am a massive vic and bob fan i love them vic's art i've got some up here actually uh and i love bob's stuff he does you know I love his anti-celebrity thing he got he's got going. I love all that. Yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah. So it was it was an honour, really. Well, it's great to have you here, Vaughan. Thank you. So you grew up in uh, Bob's part of the world, yeah? I grew up in yeah. I was born in Southbank. Uh, no, sorry, I was born in Grangetown, Whitworth Road, uh, which is like a really poor part of a, a suburb of Middlesbrough. Uh, so and then I sort of didn't move really. I live in North Yorkshire now, a bit away, but my dad's still in Middlesbrough. Uh, one of my brothers is in still in you know uh, the area. So I've you know I've no I've no real. I love it. I love the area. And John mm. moved up actually. John John is from Sussex and he came up to visit a few times. He said I love it here because people don't realise that. There's the Cleveland Hills, there's the coastline, there's the Yorkshire Dales. You know, I mean, literally 15 minutes away. Of course, yeah. we see that on the media, we see the chemical works and the steel works. But, you know, that's a small part of a big, big area. You know? yeah. But I love yeah. it up here. And in fact, Paul Whitehouse said, I met Paul. Um, well, I actually met him when he filmed at my, uh, in a previous life, I was in the oil and gas industry and they filmed the fast show episode on the site and I met Paul and he was lovely then and I met him again while filming they'd already done uh, Gone Fishing first or second series and uh, he came in to see Bob because he was doing Only Fools and Horses mm. the, in the West End and I was sat as I always am just sat watching Vic and Bob perform and Paul sort of creeped over sat down um, and said oh you, you're great in this so must have, I must have already had a series out. He said, you just get the humour. You, you just seem part of it. I said, I think it's down from where I'm from, really. Yeah. You know, I know Vic's sort of darling and Leeds, but Vic's in a world of his own. And I mean that in a massive compliment. Mm. You know, a massive, the fella's a genius. Um, but, you know, that sort of humour is very, very common up here. Um, that uh, That sort of deprecating sort of, piss takey sort of daft surreal humor i think i think it's it's part of this area but uh yeah so it was nice of paul to say that as well i thought i thought mm. that we didn't have to didn't have oh, to come over yeah yeah because i mean he's an, he, another comedy hero even though you weren't in the industry before your comedy was a massive part massive, of your life yeah massive from watching the cubes michael um michael spilligan <laughs> spike milligan <laughs> Mike Mike was great, but he wasn't as good as Spike. <laughs> not a patch on Spike. <laughs> no, he didn't get his breaks. His poetry Spike not had as the good. interesting name. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's from watching the QCs with my dad, you know, and then um, I watched everything. Mark and Wise, mm. Laurel Hardy's always been massive in my in my life. Yeah, uh, watching them, even broad comedies, really. You know, I wasn't sort of snobby. Mm. But I think things like the Young Ones and Filthy Rich and Cat Flap comic strip. I mean, I'm 57 years old, so I know, you know, I, I, I was I was old enough to see those first time round. And I think when, when you see them again, you do, you don't realise the shock 
value of things like that. Yeah. Even the young ones look so tame now, but mm. you know there was thousands of complaints about it. You know, going to the BBC. So yeah, so from that aspect, I've been a massive comedy fan all my life and still are. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's the thing. I suppose stuff like that is it's very much of its time. It couldn't be mm. made now. Do you know what I mean? But it was made at the right time. No, yeah, exactly. And it did. It, it was sort of like. I mean, I know the analogy to punk has been made numerous of times about alternative comedy. Yeah, yeah. But the effect on the comedy circuit was exactly the same as punk in the music industry, really. Mm. It was a paradigm shift from, you know, have you seen my wife, you know, whatever, to, like, things that could be surreal, uh, things that didn't actually happen, but, you know, stories were threaded around nonsense and things like that you know mm. it it made the audience think and it also made the audience it gave it complemented the audience by giving it some intelligence yeah. by being able to fathom what was going on you know and that yeah. i think that's always important and i think what um people forget now is that there were only three tv channels well the comic strip mm. was the first night of channel four so that was yeah four. um yeah and so there was no escaping it. it was this was on mainstream tv it wasn't like hidden away on the internet as something like that might be nowadays it no was it was event tv as well you know you had yeah. to sit down and watch it because yeah. there was no point recording it because the next day in the office or the school or college you heard every line every yeah. joke you know yeah. so you had to watch it that night mm. or you you weren't part of the crowd yeah yeah no spoilers well, no, but the BBC was massive. Was massive. You look at the seventies and the eighties and the viewing figures, like Morecambe and Wise. And oh, the Ronnies, huge. The, the Ronnies were getting million. millions and millions. You know, eighteen, twenty mm. million generation game. Larry Grayson, wonderful man. Uh, Frankie Howard, yeah, a lecherous old queen apparently, but love. You know, great comedian, great line giver. Kenneth Williams, I love Kenneth Williams. Yeah, yeah, just amazing people. Just mm. so talented, so tortured as well, bless them. But just, and Kenneth Williams' diaries is a staple in my toilet mm. shelf because yeah. it, you, I can go to it and just read some. Yeah. <laughs> and he was such a bitch, so funny. Now there's an image, there's an image for <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's I, phenomenal. I, I, I won't go into any further detail. <laughs> But yeah, sometimes I'm in the toilet a long time. It's medication. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, it's a no. Big book. <laughs> it's a big book. It is yeah. a big book. I'd love to see the actual diaries because there's a lot mm, that yeah. uh, he wouldn't uh, publish. Who did it? Trevor? Is it? Anyway. Comes but apparently he was interviewed when it Russell came Russell Davis. Him. No, it wasn't. Not Russell, Russell T. Davis. Not Russell T. Davis. No, no, Davis. Russell Davis, was it? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll bow down to your I think so. better memory. But yeah, yeah. so anything <clears> like that. I, I find individuals, people outside of the norm, in always interesting and funny. Yeah. You know, I think that's why I was a big Bowie fan. Um, I mean, a lot of people are, but I just found him just utterly fascinating. Doing his own thing. Uh, yeah, was it? Mm. Doing his own thing, wasn't he? Do you know what I mean? He was like, he was, yeah. he kept reinventing himself. Because he got bored. I mean, yeah. people thought it was some sort of, uh, clever trick you know to to maintain a, an image but he just got bored which is great yeah. isn't it yeah i'm bored yeah. of this now i'll do something else <laughs> jim <laughs> and bob are similar to that to be honest you are yeah. mate sorry I'm i think dead. jim and bob are similar to that as well yeah yeah, they're yeah only, they i mean the writing process is interesting in itself i don't know if anyone else has spoken about it but from what i gather and what they've told me is what they either go to what each other's house and sit down and write. And I think I think Jim said, no, Bob said, and Jim always brings this smelly foreign food and stinks the kitchen out of the studio. <laughs> or and but and uh, Vic and Jim said he uh, Bob brings around meat products, you know, like <laughs> meat, meat. Calls them. <laughs> yeah. So um so they sort of <clears throat> start having ideas, and if they both laugh at an idea, it goes in the script. Mm. If one of them doesn't laugh, it doesn't go in, which I find really interesting. I mean, it sounds obvious, really, but you know, that's a that's a pretty tough 
uh, set of rules, really, when you think about it. If you, I, you know, you've written comedy, I write comedy, uh, not very well, but I write it. Um, and that's a real hard rule because you, you might be passionate about an idea, but if one of them doesn't laugh, it's not in, you know, which yeah. I thought was amazing. When I first went down there, um, I was expecting a costume, lines. I got the script, obviously, costume, makeup, being told exactly what to do by the director of or Jim and Bob. And it was nothing of the sort. They just sort of, I said, I've brought this knacker tracksuit down and a pair of clogs, a pair of <laughs> Crocs, other rubber based products are available <laughs> for your for your feet. Um <laughs> And he said, yeah, that'll do. No worries. <laughs> and then, so do you, we'd rehearse sort of normally a day and a half um, or a day. And they would do a lot of the cutaways, you know, the stuff that needs a long time in makeup or whatever on the, on the rehearsal day. But they were really, really receptive to ideas. Mm. Really unbelievably free, kind and trusting t- for me to go out and say something that wasn't in the script or, yeah, you know. I mean, the first series, I was just, the, the, the first special, I was just shit scared to get it right, you know. But by the sort of second series, halfway through the first season, second series, uh, you know, I, I'd lived a bit. Mm. Um, and you can tell and, they enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, it, it was always a true pleasure when I could get them to laugh. And the crew. Yeah, in yeah. rehearsal, I'd come up with something. And, you know, to get genuine laughs like that is, you know, film crews and set crews and, and TV crews are hardened, you know, people. They don't they don't laugh at nothing. Um yeah. so it was nice to it was nice to be able to do that. Yeah. And I would just sit I like I'd have a two two PM call because I might have three lines, but I'd turn up at half ten. And sit there all day, just what I mean, who wouldn't? No, yeah, uh, sit, uh, sit and watch Jim and Bob just create, change things. You know, why Why don't you say that? Well, if I say that, then um, <clears throat> then you could hit me with the pan, then I'll offer you out for a fight, you know. And then they'd say to Matt Whitecross, who's an amazing director, uh. You know, we're gonna do a fight. Where where do you think? And then Matt would set the cameras up and they'd go for it. You know, it was just just really just fascinating, yeah. genuinely fascinating to see. So going back a bit, Vaughan, obviously you said you had a very successful career, completely different career before uh, yeah. Vic and Bob's big night out. So how did you get from that to being on the telly with Vic and Bob? Was um, there any kind of acting training? Did you do any kind of I did acting in college and school. Mm. But I tended to ruin plays by trying to make people laugh. Mm. <laughs> I remember there was a particularly dry uh, Victorian farce, Chris Pearson, I wonder if he's still alive, the drama teacher at Gilbrook School. And he, he decided to do this, because obviously you're limited, aren't you, what you can put on stage at school. So he, he dug out this Victorian farce, and it was as dry as mm. a desert. And... Um, so I just used to come on every night with someone else from the our dressing room was with the woodwork class. So I'd come on with a mallet, you know, and threaten the I just ad lib and I came in with a boiled egg once and cracked it and started <laughs> eating it, you know. Just to and it all got laughs, you know, and I thought, oh, this is good. Because I was, you know, that's I was the class idiot anyway. Typical, you know, class clown. So I think that's the only training I had, really. And living with three brothers who could beat the shit out of you. <laughs> uh, one of them being younger than me as well. Um, so, yeah, so you get to sort of, you get to find your skills quite quickly and making people laugh was a real good way of avoiding getting a pasty at yeah. school or at home. Um, but, yeah, what happened was, um, I don't know if you... Do you know about Sporting Keith? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sporting Keith was a character that rang in on on one of Ian Lee's shows. And uh I was I I used to ring in as Clive Sutcliffe, no relation. That was the joke. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, it's Clive Sutcliffe, no relation. I'm just ringing up to tell you about me prostrate. You know, and Ian had, like, he knew what it was, and he, we, we just, um, I've ruined the bus seat, so I'm going to have to pay for that. Apparently there was a lot of seepage this time, just really disgusting stuff. And Ian had, like, fain sort of disgust and cut me off. And then this other guy came on called Pat Riley, and he lived with his mum. His mum was in a wheelchair, and, and he was this little fair sort of guy. Hello, Ian. I'm 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 just with mum. She's gone to sleep on my lap. Um, I'm going to do some uh, improvisational ribbon dancing for you. This is on the radio, obviously. <laughs> so then he play he play the theme to Z Cars or something like that. You'd hear smashing. And he said, oh, oh, mum's princess Diana plate's been broken. <laughs> and, and just really, and it, the, the, the pictures, he, and it, it, the pictures that this Pat Riley put forward were just amazing. Turned out to be John, John O'Sullivan. So we, that's how we met. But incidentally, one night I rang up as Clive Sutcliffe, no relation, and said, that Spartan Keith's a liar. He, yeah. Uh, He's old known round old village. He t he picks his nephew up in his slippers from school. He's th that's uh, I think the D I think the DHS is investigating him for fiddling his bed. Just stuff like that, you know. And um, Sporting Keith, of course, was on the uh, talk was Bob, about his was, nephew. Yeah, his, yeah Bob it was Bob. Me. Yeah, and <laughs> of course, yes, Bob Keith. Was stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was obvious it was Bob. But yeah. it was just so funny. I've done a bit of a video for you, Ian, if you want to put it on your YouTube and that. Um, <laughs> it's a great and, video. Uh, yeah, it's absolute shit. <laughs> but um, but it was so funny because you knew it was Bob. And, I mean, he obviously sat at home, finished watching Teen Mums or whatever he watches. Because <laughs> <and then, laughs> he watches shit. Oh, man, the housewife <laughs> stuff he watches. Yeah, yeah, and he got me on the case cooking. <laughs> while we were filming Vic and Bob. Have you seen Case Cooking no. on YouTube? Case Cooking is this woman in Sheffield or somewhere in this... It's not a designer kitchen. Um, and the hob needs some work. And she makes things like, Hello, everybody. I'm right going to make, you know, <laughs> um, a Big Mac from home. And, like, she'd get these horrible, like, crusty buns and then half cook a beef burger. Please, whoever's listening, go and see Kay's cooking. She's amazing. Oh, In no. fact, I, I'm almost certain that it's a comedy <laughs> character that someone's made up. But mm. uh, And a son who's lactose intolerant can only taste certain things that she makes. <laughs> and he goes, it doesn't taste like the one in the shops, Mum. <laughs> but anyway, so he got me out. So Bob watches shit, basically. And anyway, so he he rang up, and then a couple of weeks later, I got um, I got an email from uh, or a DM from Ian Lee saying Bob Morton has been in touch. Can he use that your phone call in a show that he's doing? I went, yeah. Of course. He said, all right, good. Do you mind me giving you giving him your email? I went, yeah. So a few days later, I got this email. Me and Jim are writing for a new show. Um, I really like the stuff you did on the radio, you know, with Ian Lee. Do you fancy auditioning? Send us a tape if we send you some script. So I did it in the kitchen here, and uh, my son recorded it. I did it three different ways, like natural like slow and daft or, or proper burra, you know, mm. burra accent, like, you know what I mean? What are you looking at? Like that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then a, a week later, he said, oh, it's brilliant, yeah. Uh, the BBC will be in touch, and that was it. Wow. So we went. I went down, I think it was, was it 2016, 2017? Yeah. For the Christmas? yeah. It was called a Chris. it was the 25th anniversary, so what's that? 2017. Yeah. Because was um, was Vic and was Vic Reeves Big Night Out on 92 on top of 90 and 91. Yeah. Oh, 1991. So yeah. it probably was 2016. It's the 25th anniversary or something. <clears throat> and it was classed as a special and it was going to go out near Christmas. What I didn't realize was it was basically a broadcast pilot to see if they'd get an audience. Um, and they did. It was re really well received, I think. 
And I got loads of reaction. It was just tremendous. It was just unbelievable. And then the next year, 2018, I think BBC Two gave them four episodes. And then 2019, they gave them another four for BBC Four, which then went to BBC Two. So I was down there for every... I was down there every one, you know. I mean, the character of... Are we calling him the character Vaughan? That's what they call him at the end of well, the show, Well, that's what we, we, we talked about Clive from the radio, but then I think Bob just said, we'll just call you your name, Vaughan. Um, yeah, so it was... A, so, so, you know, with, it's difficult to say. I w- I'd hate to say that it's... A lot of the character comes from the words he speaks, but okay. I brought... I brought the costume and and the mannerisms and the, uh, and the, the bold, this m- northeastern confidence that you'll get away with anything, you know. So like, yeah, I'm Tom Cruise, Anna, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And um, well, he looks like him, doesn't he? You know, it's just <laughs> stupid, and I loved it a bit. So uh, you know, being able to say that sort of thing um, was was truly magical, really. You know, I'll yeah. never forget it. Excuse me, I'm having a drink. Bob obviously Finish liked off. what he saw. You know, for for Bob to come to you, come to you like that, he obviously yeah. loved what you were doing. You know. Well, he, he did. I mean, he's done the same with most people, really. Mm. He did it with with Dan Skinner uh, as Angelos. Yeah. And you know, and and Dan sent him a video, a VHS tape. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago, uh, and it said, "I've done this. What next?" On a piece yeah. of toilet paper or tissue or yeah. something, yeah. and he ended up, you know, on spit on uh, shooting stars. stars and, yeah. Mm. And Angelos is a terrible comedy character, really <laughs> bad. Oh, your war, <laughs> your your ongoing war with Angelos yeah. is, you know, yeah, he's a fake. He's absolutely it's... shit. He just comes on. He comes on with a carrier bag and thinks that's comedy. You know what I mean? As you know, whereas I. Try and develop a, a long process of. I mean, I I studied in France clowning. I went to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I went to Brazil to 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 teach uh, myself the moves for comedy through um, Brazilian martial arts. You know, I've spent thirty <laughs> years developing my. He comes on with a carry bag and a long tie, and and get you know, and people actually sometimes pay to watch him. I find it ma- remarkable. I really. I'm going to see you it. next week, Vaughan. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, say hello, say hello for me. Won't you? <laughs> oh, the insult! The insults being thrown backwards and forwards on. I know. Twitter. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I know. So we should publish them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, we thought we, we were thinking about doing something about it, but then sort of COVID came, and then I got ill again. You know, and we haven't done it, but we. I mean, if he's up here, I always go and see him. Uh, Dan, I don't watch Angelos. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he's lovely, Dan. He's a really nice guy. And I've uh, become recent come friend, well, last couple of years with Alex Law, oh, yeah. who does Barry from Watford and yeah. uh, Clinton Baptiste. And he's just a, he's such a lovey. You know, he's a, he's an actor's actor, is Alex. Yeah. Like, we love, we love Alex. Yeah, you did, yeah, he you is, did a he's short with him. Absolutely lovely. You did a short um, Clinton Baptiste um, film. With yeah, him. yeah, yeah. Which is oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, funny enough, the day after that, I had a heart attack. Believe it or not. Oh, was it? Yeah, oh, God. yeah. It was the day after that I had a heart attack. Yeah. You ended up. Um, you were Liam, I think. Liam, yes. Yeah, super fan, stalker. <laughs> yeah, it was funny that, and we it was with the uh, Darren Dutton. And and Alex and I wrote the piece, you know, on the day really. And Alex knows what Alex knows what his character wants and does. But he again, he was very free and open for me to do. You know, or we'd, we I'd add lib, and he'd go, and, and everyone would, you know, laugh hopefully, and then he'd say, right, can we do that again? But like, so I can react properly because mm-hmm. you know people laugh. So. But yeah, it was a good little story, that wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's I think it's had about thirty-five thousand views or something. It's it's wow. not a bad little thing. Yeah, uh, Paula was going to say to you, we've every podcast we end up talking about Alex Lowe. We're going to have to have a spin-off podcast. 
Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Well, everyone, everyone we talk to is connected everyone mentions to him. him. Every he's done everything. time we talk to somebody, he gets mentioned. So, you know, oh, he's amazing. Well, he, like, literally, he literally has worked with everyone. I he's mean, been around a long time. He was in Peter's Friends with Stephen <laughs> Fry, Hugh Laurie, and Emma Thompson. Uh, Emma Thompson. You yeah. just think, fuck oh, off. Yeah, work, with, Ken, work with Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what, are you do, what are you doing putting a blonde wig on and going, especially tonight? You know, you should be, you should be doing Shakespeare, mate. I do <laughs> take the piss out of him, but he, he takes it in good stead. He is very professional and he is very good at what he does. Yeah. And he works hard at it, so... You know, there's proof. Same with Dan. Dan works hard. Mm. The, you know, anyone with anyone doing character comedy, you have to be that person. Mm. You can't, you can't think above it or outside it. And mm. I, I did this uh, female character called Jam on on our internet show uh, during lockdown. It's called Late Night Lockdown, and Jam stands for James Arthur's mum. <laughs> right. And I played this awful woman. Um, you can find it online, TikTok and yeah. stuff. And an awful big sort of permed hair, really rubbish makeup. And I was filth, like really foul, filthy, horrible, puerile rubbish. And I loved it to bits. And after, and we did 150 shows. Wow. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And we were getting two and a half thousand people on, on Facebook watching us and stuff like that. It was amazing. But I sometimes I used to uh, watch it. We'd record it live, so there was a video on Facebook, and I'd watch him back and start laughing at what Jam said because I didn't remember. I, I genuinely, I know it sounds wanky, but I genuinely didn't remember what she said because yeah. I was Jam, and it's weird as hell to do it afterwards. To think afterwards, you know, I don't, I don't think. When I was yeah. jam, anyway, I didn't think, oh, right, I'm going to do this and I'll have a cup of tea and then I'll read a book or something. It was just like I I do work in an old people's home and I do masturbate old men to death to steal watches. <laughs> that's what a modus operandi was. So that's the level it was at. <laughs> it must be like fl <laughs> flicking yeah. off a switch, you know, to be crude again, flicking Pick off a switch. <laughs> yeah, she didn't. She Talking to that, Kenneth Williams well, I think, in the end, <laughs> but, <a> uh, <laughs> you know, when you see people like Alex and you know the, yeah. the John Shuttleworths of the world, they fully inhabit. You got to commit hundred percent. The world, yeah. it's they are that person. Do you know what I mean? All in, in or not in, and, yeah. and you're right. When I when I put the wig on and the makeup on, and then the glasses, these and it, old NHS glasses with with the red mark on them. I don't know where John got them from. There's a red mark. And he would throw me curveballs all the time. He'd say, Jam, uh, how did you get that red mark on your glasses? I've, I've always wanted to ask. So then I couldn't just say, oh, it's lipstick. I, I had to, you know, you have to entertain people. So I said, well, I was at a Cliff Richard concert. And obviously I'd wheedle my way to the front. Massive Cliff Richard fan. And he stood, he put, he put one foot on the monitor speaker. And he was singing Living Doll. And I noticed his little plums in his velveteen trousers just perched nicely. So I reached up like a bird, like a plucking apples from a tree and just cut them gently. And a bouncer punched me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> then I was thrown out. I'm banned now. I'll never see Cliff again. But, it, you know, and it, I'm thinking, I'm watching it afterwards thinking, where, where did that, you know, I know it sounds puerile and stupid, but... It was like, where did that come from? Because <laughs> he put me on the spot complete. There's no script or anything, obviously. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, going back to the big night out, there were another yeah. couple of characters that you um, inhabited. One being um, Bill Decker's wife, Joan. Yes, Joan. Bill Decker, the murderer. That was <laughs> He's funny. got a great look. Yeah, I know. Uh, Jim had made this towel mask, a uh, tea towel mask. <laughs> I don't know what he was going to use it for. <laughs> and I, I had this sort of like old cotton net uh, dressing night dress or something you'd call it, I guess, house gown or something. I'd yeah, yeah. And I roll up my uh, tracksuit bottoms to get in it, and I put this face mask on. And uh, we rehearsed it. It was a, it was a bit longer in rehearsal because I had to fight Bob, I, and he said, "When you fight me, like grab hold of me, throw me on the floor." 
And he said, because if you don't, it won't look convincing. And maybe I didn't look convincing. But anyway, and he said, um, Jim, I'll ask you your name. And you just say, Joan. So, like, I, d- I thought to myself, I can't just, like, do it in Vaughn's voice. So, And if you notice, I, I put my hands like that. I cut my hands like this. So I'm, I'm stood there like that. And I just, <laughs> he went, uh, Jim said, Who, who's this? And he said, uh, oh, this is my wife, Joan. And I just went, Joan! And, like, <laughs> in rehearsal, and everyone cracked up. So it stayed in, you know. Yeah. Great, but it was mad, absolutely yeah. mad. There's a yeah, there's a sinister story behind those two. There must yeah, be. yeah. <laughs> I don't know what yeah, that there one is. is. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's funny how they just left it. No explanation, yeah. nothing. This is my Bill Decker's wife, John. John, yeah. and that was it. <laughs> so the other one you do, if you can call it a character, is a ghost who just comes out the door yeah. occasionally and says sorry and yeah. then disappears again. Did they explain yeah. what that was about? No. <laughs> no, and the thing about Jim, uh, you, you're aware Jim is a dadaist in yeah, yeah. in essence. So Jim would continue doing that for hours uh, because it's funny. Then it isn't funny, and then it's funny. I mean, the dadaist did things like that, didn't they? You know what I mean? Yeah. They did things beyond humour. You know, it became sort of like a chore. I always yeah. remind me of, of Andy. Um, reading out Huckleberry Finn to an audience. What was his name? Andy, Andy Kaufman. Kaufman. Yes. Yeah, yes. so it's that sort of thing. So we do it for ages and ages and ages, uh, you know, through a dance scene or something like that. I'd come out and go, sorry, and just <laughs> go back in. And I was thinking, I mean, it's funny, but when you actually see it on screen, it genuinely is. And then it just becomes more funny, I think, the yeah. longer you do it. Yeah, in the end, actually, I was that knackered at one point. I said, um, is there any way we can get someone else to put the ghost thing on and then just use my voice in it? Because I said, I can't. I was still ill, obviously. Um, and I was on a lot of steroids at the time. I don't know if you notice how, I mean, I'm not a little lad, but I was a big, quite big then. And I had mm. a big balloon face and it was down to, to steroids for, for inflammation. So it gave me loads of energy, but it, it swells you up. So I said, and they kindly did that for me a couple of times, which was good. Or they'd yeah. say, "Can do you, do you fancy doing this?" And I say, "I'm, I just can't physically, you know, climb over or do this." So very understanding, very understanding. My favourite well, character probably, I like Rod Stewart <laughs> because. I think I really caught the essence. <laughs> <laughs> Captured his essence, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know... There's, Kicking there's, the back in singers I mean, at the Superficially, you can put some leotard, leopard skin leotards on, prance around, shouting Maggie May. <laughs> but there's an inner part of Rod that I think I cop- captured that nobody else had. <laughs> that was fantastic. Hanging I mean... around with the drummer looking at the fat lasses. <laughs> Yeah. In fact, we did some more, but they were cut. Oh, right. I think, yeah. I, I don't know. I, my memory's really bad, but we did Judge Rinder as well. No, that Judge didn't Judge Rinder. No, I don't no. think that was on, was it? Uh, I think we changed it in the end. I don't know yeah. why they did just four episodes per series, because mm. the standard's usually six. I know. It, but... it's, it was it was guilt. It was yeah. money. But, but no, that... When the, you were ex superb on that show, and I assumed, and I thought I must have seen this guy in something before because you were so confident in it, or seemed yeah. so natural in it. Yeah, um, you weren't, didn't seem phased. The thing is, if you remember me saying I'd I'd been diagnosed with terminal cancer and given nine months to live, mm. and you know I know that it's this words bandied around battled, fought, whatever. But I decided, my son at the time was four-year-old, wow. five-year-old. So I decided early on that I was going to do everything I could to make sure I saw him grow up. So I accepted every treatment. I skipped down to the operating theatres, much to the amazement of my friends and my partner and family, because I knew it was the best thing for me to survive and see my son grow up. Yeah. So nothing after that really fazed me. And that might sound arrogant. I'm sure if a lion jumped out in the road in front of me, I'd probably wish I never said that. But, <laughs> you know, 
for normal everyday things, it doesn't. It didn't phase. It doesn't phase me because I've. You know, I'm. I. You know, the term borrowed time. I just thought I'm going to enjoy every minute. And luckily, I've survived, and what have you. And people don't. God, God bless them. Um, and I was extremely lucky because it was a very rare cancer that that doesn't normally go where it did, and you know all of that. But when when that opportunity came, I just thought, well, I'm going to enjoy this. You know, I'm going to might not, you know, because you remember, I didn't know there was going to be any more. Yeah. Mm. So I did that first one thinking, what a great experience. I've met Bob, I've met Jim, I met Matt Whitecross, who's an amazing man, you know. Uh, so I was quite happy with that. So when it came back, it's sort of like, oh, great, we'll do it again, you know. Yeah. Oh, stuff like oh, that, it change, you. changes your whole outlook, doesn't it? The, the way you view everything, it, cha- it changes, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't bother go- trying to go back to a career or anything. Mm. I mean, it affected me financially immensely. Mm. Obviously not working properly anyway. Mm. And as you know, the bits and pieces one does on telly is not it's not the bonanza that people think it is. Yeah. <laughs> but so I uh so I made a decision that I wasn't going to kill myself ever again over work or ambition mm. or anything. Because, you know, when I got ill, I was doing 60, 80 hours a week. Wow. Going around Europe, flying here, flying there. Yeah. Driving from, you know, to Southampton and back in the day so I could see Henry before he went to bed and stuff like that. I just think, mm. you know, I just thought, no, it's not for me now. Yeah. And luckily this came along. You know, Vic and Bob came along for me to do something I really enjoyed and I cherished. I, you know, I'll never, ever, ever forget the kindness that Bob and Jim did for me. Mm. You know, I see it as just an honour, as a, a bit in my life that was great, and it allowed me to do a few other things. That I, I, I worked with Rebecca Front in a short scene. Um, I was on the uh, the Nish Kumar Mash report. You know, so it was nice. It, it's been nice, yeah. So. Mm. That the Uncle Provocateur sketch was it, Vaughan? I think on the Master yes, Report. it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Well done. It's on YouTube. I wasn't watching it. Yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was well, during lockdown, wasn't I, it? Because he, I think so. Yeah, we did it all self tape. Yeah, mm. but uh, a certain actor said to said to me, which was I took as a compliment. You look like the only real twatty, <laughs> the real Uncle Provocateur. <laughs> and I went, oh, thanks. Yeah, I think, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you also did a film with a short film with uh, John and uh, if I pronounce it correctly, Lucia Ravardi Tomlinson. Yes, is that correct. Oh yes, we did taking, taking care, care, which is Have a similar character. To, yeah, yeah, similar character what? to the Vaughan from um, from Big Nice Out, wasn't it? Yeah, it's it, it. What 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 we were trying to do was use the words taking care in a sort of obtuse way because. If you think about it, I'm, as we developed the and we've we've written five or six episodes of it of a mm. of a full, and it turns out that Lu, that uh, Lucia and John, who were there to support me, are actually weaker than me, mm. and I'm the carer really, even though I'm disabled and which I am in real life. I mean, I can't walk very far. I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I can't do anything. I can't exercise. I can't do anything. In real life, so uh, you know, so I ended up. Um, I ended. We ended up writing about what I knew, which was being labelled as someone disabled. Um, my dad's in a wheelchair, so I, I saw it through his eyes as well. Being and then people thinking that you you can't do anything or you're not mm. a viable human being, and it it struck me strongly that you know a lot of disabled people have more spirit. And more go than you know Olympic swimmers. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Getting up, getting up, getting dressed, taking your son to school yeah. when you've had chemotherapy is probably harder than swimming a hundred meters in the Olympics. I know it sounds daft, but you know the the will. You know it's comparable anyway. The mm. will that you need to do to overcome that mm. physical barrier. So I just wanted to try and portray a, a disabled person who was actually powerful. Uh, and as the story went on, of course, 
I became more powerful. And there's a bit of a revenge thing where I sort of a vengeful with, it's like a comedy drama, vengeful with uh, people who are, uh, have beaten up Lucia or, or cheated John. But, you know, it was in that sort of vein of comedy that we, we try to put in the little taster. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it, Paula, but it's all right, isn't it? Yeah. Huh? I mean, yeah, yeah. And it look, is it a red car, is it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it looks, the, the, the setting is perfect for it. It's yeah, like out no, of season we, holiday time. Yeah, we, 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 we obviously, that was a whole part of it. And I love the North East, so I wanted to show the North East as it is and, and I tell you who filmed it was Ross Marshall. Ross Marshall is a is a DOP, and he's doing major stuff now. I mean, right. like Netflix films. Wow. He he, he was DOP on um, Witchfinder General. You know the BBC thing mm. with. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and he's amazing. He's got such an eye, and if you can watch some of, he's got the best aspect of a DOP is if you see some, you go. That's Ross Marshall, that. And all the best DOPs have a flavour or a yeah, tint yeah. on mm. everything, don't they? And um, and he he does. He's his brother to Tom Marshall, who's a quite a successful director. Now he did. He's done Netflix and comedy shows and what have you. And I'm trying to get him to pin him down to do this Jim Captain Cook thing, where it's only a sketch, but I love the idea. It was Tom's idea where. James, Captain James Cook, I don't know if you're aware of the guy. He was yeah, from yeah. Middlesbrough. He was born in Middlesbrough. And he ended up uh, doing all this stuff. And he comes home to his wife in this little cottage. And she's like, where have you been? He's like, well, I've been to fucking Australia. And I've, I've discovered that. And then we went up there and what, we found a place called Packing New Guinea. Yeah, but you haven't sent me any, you know, that's just like yeah, a yeah. full domestic, just ripping... The heart out of the whole James Cook thing. I just thought it was funny. <laughs> Typical Middlesbrough couple, you know what I mean? I haven't great. seen my mum in six months because you wouldn't take me. You know, all that sort of thing. Well, like, you've, I've got the money, you've got the money for a coach and you know, horses. Why don't you, you know, all that sort of bollocks? So <laughs> I really want to do that. Yeah. So going back to the, the big night out, um, what was your relationship like with George Ezra? <laughs> He appeared um, in one episode, didn't he? George, my relationship with George Ezra <laughs> was sparse. <laughs> Not because of George Ezra, but because of his team. Oh, right. I, I spoke to George a couple of times, said, I'll do, love your song, great song. Oh, thanks. But, um, yeah, it wasn't, you know, I mean... I didn't even know who he was, I'll be honest with you. No, it was very uh, but, early days. I think that, that was the yeah. episode I came to see. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's a great song, that one, isn't it? Nobody really it's, knew who he was at that time. No, I don't think so. Him. I mean, he's massive now, I guess, is mm. he? I don't know. But he's lovely. Hit, he? Don't get me wrong, he was so good. <clears throat> he was so willing to be in anything. You know, mm. the tense sketch, sketch and all that, where he built a chair in a sketch, if you remember. And he, he was just he was just stood there being directed, you know. And it was he had no ego on him. He's lovely, polite, you know. He reminded me of a polite public school boy showing showing parents around the the you know the ancient yeah. school. I don't know where he's from. He might be from South Bank, and he might be from <laughs> you know some shit all. I don't know, but that's where he. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and I really don't think so. No. Yeah, but he's lovely. Who's that guy who's standing think... next to him? He's massive. When he's doing the song, it's, it's like oh, he's Bob's nephew foot. or something. He's a good six foot three, four, something like that. Yeah. Seems it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, he so, was good. He was good. Yeah. So what's next for you, Vaughan? Are you working on any projects at the moment? Um, no. No, I'm uh, still not very well. Hmm. Uh, um, I spent. You've got to look uh, after you. Look after your health, Vaughan. You know. I will. Yeah, I spent uh, a couple of weeks in Brighton visiting my friend, mm. um, and then last week I went down to Sussex to support John um, after things happened, and um, and I'm going back down there next week, obviously for a ceremony. 
Um, but yeah, uh, but there's nothing in the pipelines. I know uh, Lucia's written writing a script for uh, Hattrick, which she wants me to be in. And my mate Miles Chapman's got as I don't know if he's that being commissioned, but Miles Chapman from um, Lee and the, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lee and Colin or something. I don't know. He'll kill He's me. Stuck with us. He's fucking. He will absolutely destroy me for this. Um, and I've been down. I spent a weekend last year down at his house, and we we spent a week at his holiday home. Uh, he rents out. He made. It. He charged us. You know, obviously, tight twice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's he's written some with one of my other comedy heroes, Ricky Grover. Oh, oh legend! And him and Ricky are very, very good friends. And you could sit miles down and spend two days just listening to his anecdotes about Ricky Grover and his family. Yeah, I mean that you know that Buller sort of Buller, yeah. character in the East End. That's all true. His whole family are just. Magnificent examples of Britishness. I Lee and Dean, him. by the um, way. Sorry. You what? Lee, Lee and Dean. Dean I've just Googled yeah. it. Well, sorry, Ma- it. sorry, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly as bad as Mike Spilligan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah. No, goodness. Yeah, credit. so that yeah, so there's a few things down mm. the pipe, but you know what these things are like. They're just mm. and it's a difficult, I think, I think the industry's a in a bit of a flux anyway, isn't yeah. it? Mm-hmm. I mean, auditioning now, the great thing about auditioning for even small parts is you do self-tapes now, so that's a lot better for me because, I can, mm. you know, I've got the uh, I've got the nouse and the equipment to do it, but it's just finding the right parts. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm overweight, 57, northeast lad, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not going to appear in a Shakespeare mm. play unless it's, <laughs> unless it's false staff or or one of the other sort of Never fat, like middle-aged. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I just keep I keep nudging my agent on bits and pieces, and, and that's it. you just got to keep yeah. going, haven't you? Ah, oh, yeah. Well, I'm in we a lucky about. position because, in the sense that I'm skinned, but I haven't got a mortgage to pay because I rent this place. I had to sell this house, believe it or not, uh, mm. when I became ill because I couldn't afford the mortgage. So, so I sort of... So now I rent it from a landlord, a house I've been in for 28 years, believe it or not. Mm. Um, So I don't, you know, I can afford to live fairly frugally, fairly well. Don't go on foreign holidays much. Don't smoke, don't drink. But, you know, I can manage a steak now and again. (laughs) And I sleep a lot, which is always very cheap. (laughs) But as you say before... um... It's great to put stuff online, like I do and you, and you have done, but there's no money yeah. in it, and you don't do it no. for that reason anyway. And it, and if something we always bring up in every episode, if Jim and Bob can't get funding for, for the glove because it's so hard to get films made nowadays, and what chances crazy, has anyone it? got? Yeah, but um, no, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, you know, the gone fishing thing is an amazing program, but mm. it's you know it's relatively cheap. Mm. In the sense, there's what five or six people plus Bob and and Paul, accommodation costs, whatever. But but uh, yeah, so so you know things like that will always reality will always reality shows will always be now you know the one. I mean, if you, even if you think like, I mean, I, I've got I'm a big fan of Stanley Baxter. Mm. Yeah, and I've got a couple of his DVDs, and the money they spend. You know, he did full, full musical numbers with oh, twenty but... dancers and swimmers, and and mm. you just think it must have been cost of mi- the equivalent of millions massive, and millions. Yeah, yeah. One I remember. I remember. You know, for the second series, and I hope they don't mind me saying this, for the second series of Vic and Bob, they had to cut a lot away because of what they wanted to do, because of you know they shaved off the budget yet again. Because obviously, the, there must be some internal thing from the. I don't know, I'm guessing the first four went on BBC two, the second four went on BBC four. So there must mm. be like different budgeting mm. criteria. Yeah, criteria. Yeah, sure. I mean we talked to Charlie before, Charlie Higson um about the smell and the tiny little inserted scenes that lasted a matter of seconds, especially the introductory 
bits of the show. Yeah. But the budget for them, the costumes and the set and the lighting and the amount of mm-hmm. actors in it was massive. And they, that just wouldn't happen today. No. no. And, I mean, look at Shoot the Stars. Some of the best comedy, sketch comedy I've seen comes out of Shoot the Stars. Yeah. You know, the Geordie Jeans, Geordie Jumpers and the other bits and pieces. I mean, I still discover because I didn't watch I didn't watch all of Shooting Stars. It was I've never been a massive panel show fan, really. But obviously, you know, subsequent to that, you you see a lot of these sketches and the money again, the money they must have spent on it. I, I love the what I love the hernia support group. Have you seen that? And <laughs> yeah. All sat in the set, he got <laughs> I've I've had so much help with this group, you know. Because it was Johnny Vegas, Will Self, wasn't it? They were all yeah. had a go. And yeah, the music funny. parodies they did, like the, the videos and things. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's just Slayed. Perfect, yeah. yeah. My, my The biggest regret, the biggest porn I've got to pick with the BBC is House of Fools. Mm. Mm. Because yeah. I just thought it was just, it, it, it was such a shame, really, that it didn't get, you know, third series. Because it was developing really nicely. I mean, Matt Berry's a genius. Yeah. Uh, Dan Skinner's in it. <laughs> um, and, of course, the absolutely wonderful Morgana Robinson, who um, I met her and she treated me like an old friend. It was a, it, She was just such a lovely, lovely person. Um, but they have a knack, don't they, Jim and Bob? I have a knack of getting good people and nice people. I think Bob likes being surrounded by nice, normal people. Yeah. No, I think a lot of people were surprised, weren't they, that House of Fools didn't get picked up for that that no, new mm. series. Yeah. Very surprising. But again, you know, commissioners go come and go. Commission editors at the BBC. I mean, I know one person who was at BBC, then went to Channel 4, is now at Hattrick, you know, and mm. what their what their passion is is not won't be the passion of the of the twenty one year old taking the job. You know what I mean? Yeah. He says, <laughs> particularly <A> little bitterness. <laughs> oh. bitterness. <laughs> yeah, and yet there's certain shows that run and run and run. Yeah, that yeah. I'll mention the titles of. I oh, know. No, no, there's no. no logic to it at all. No. I must admit, I do miss Last of the Summer Wine. It's always on somewhere, Paul. I know, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like uh, Groundhog Day, isn't it? It's always <laughs> on at some point somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't really miss Last of the Summer Wine. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great. It was a great um, resting place for seventies actors, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. There's not many left. Bless them. I know you could count on your hand. I think who's left? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, going down hills on bath tu- in bathtubs, and you know. I mean, I'd do that if I'm if it meant I was going to get twenty years worth of sitcom. Yeah. Yeah. Even at my age now, yeah, I reckon Compo was younger than me when he started. Uh... He was. Yeah, I tell you what, when you think about that, the first series it was about three men who took early uh, took redundancy, I think. Yeah, and you think, yeah. what age were they? Fifties. Bloody yeah. hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. These old men we used to watch as kids. <laughs> the other the other program I never really got into, which is probably criminal coming for someone who likes comedy, was uh, Only Fools and Horses. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why, because, I mean, brilliant actors, brilliant premise, but I just... It never. I, I think it was because it was very London centric. I maybe I don't know, mm. but that's but, never on telly anywhere, Vaughan. So I don't think you've ever got a chance to catch. <laughs> yeah, that I'm lucky. I'm lucky because, like you say, you have Forgotten. to. You, you literally have to go on to eBay and find VHS yeah. cassettes of that. Yeah, because it's not on the telly ever. Disappeared without a trace. They yeah. should have said it in like <laughs> Halifax or somewhere. Yeah, yeah, too right. Um, <laughs> not Halifax. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the other one of this one of the TV series that that I all I love me my dad used to watch it, and it was I don't think maybe was it one series two series of Nightingales. Did you ever see oh, that? Yeah, yeah. With yeah. Robert Lindsay and uh, yeah, yeah, David, yeah. David uh, oh, David Thewlis and the guy from Zed Cars. Hey, come on, boys! Come on now! 
you know. Yeah. There's nobody here but us chickens. Right. It was again surreal and pointless. It was, it was just... wasn't one of the cast members dead in the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it was brilliant. It was amazing. It was <laughs> so <chestnut>. mad. <laughs> yeah. And, that's and a, of course, that's Robert Lindsay. Channel 4. And Robert Lindsay plays, is a great comedic actor. Mm. If you so avoid so my family. <laughs> if, you, if you avoid my family. But Wolfie Smith was good. GBH, I mean. Ugh. Oh, GBH. It's alopecia. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I remember from it's. I'm not going bald. It's alopecia. <laughs> so I remember from GB. Yes, <laughs> Vaughan, Thank you so much. It really was quite a boast. It's been really nice. It's nice to meet to make new friends. Thanks so much. Um, Look at yourself, Vaughan. Paula, um, Matt, not so much. <laughs> no, I get, no, I get that. I get He's that. He's an absolute chance. He he won't let this thing go with the glove. Do you know what I mean? He, he just he hounds every single person we've talked to. Oh. Thank you all for listening to this edition of Quad Boast. Special thanks to Matt Lucas for permission to use the Peanuts music as our theme tune, and thanks to Ed Lewis for this edit. Thank you to Jake Chesson for permission to use the photo from his 1995 shoot of Jim and Bob in our various online locations for the podcast. And of course, thank you very much to Jim Moyer and Bob Mortimer, without whom this podcast, well, it just wouldn't exist, would it? Remember to check out Paula's Divine Comedians podcast as well and to join the Reza Mortimer Depository of Curious Stuff Facebook group. And I think you'll agree that really was a lot of fun. Goodbye.